Uh, for those of you who are ready to fill up your brain, however, if you still have a little room uh, left after the last day and a half of conversations, uh, we uh, would like to ask you to join us in welcoming uh, Security B-Side's own Karen Elizari, uh, a senior researcher at Tel Aviv University and a founder of B-Side's Tel Aviv. Uh, in a conversation with Jen Easterly, the director of the United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Put your hands together. You ready to do this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah! All right, all right, all right. So thank you so much for joining us here at B-Sides Las Vegas, Jen. And hello to our friends watching from overseas. We are coming to you direct from B-Sides Las Vegas, here in beautiful, sunny, peaceful, but not so innocent Las Vegas. So <laughs> we, ha we have here with us, I believe for the first time at B-Sides Las Vegas, director yeah. Jen Easterly from the CISA agency. Jen has been with the agency for two years. She was appointed by President Biden and then unanimously confirmed by Senate to the position just about two years ago. Yeah. So a uh, happy work anniversary. <laughs> and we are, I am personally beyond thrilled to have an opportunity for a conversation with Jen or Director Easterly, but I like to call her Jen, Please if that's do. okay. Thank Please you. Please call me Jen. And I am circa 200 or 300 of my best hacker friends that I just haven't met before. So for me, coming to Hacker Summer Camp, coming to these events, and definitely besides Las Vegas, is the opportunity for the conversations that we don't get to have anywhere else. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for being with us. And I know we're going to have fun. Um, I'm not sure we're going to take questions from the room. Depends on timing and if we can uh, accommodate for that. But I just want to get started by asking you, Jen, if you can tell us, in your own words, why are you in Las Vegas this week? I know it's not for the fantastic weather or great food. So why are you in Vegas this week? I heard there was a like yeah, I heard it. Well, actually, the B-sides, but there's Katy Perry. There's a Katy I heard about that, yeah. <laughs> you got the cat ears, so, so you're ready. We're going to the Katy Perry concert, and I yeah. figure there was other stuff going on. Well, um, well, first of all, it's great to be with you, my friend. We were supposed to do this at B-sides in Tel Aviv, and then the, the flights, weather was against the flights us. and the weather got against us, so I'm so glad we could reprise it here in uh, Vegas. So uh, why am I here? Because like, this is our community. Right at the end of the day, I think Roger somewhere just came up to me and said, you know, I love that you come to these things because it's hard necessarily to um, get uh, time with government officials. And so, you know, I really see the hacker community as our community. We are the champions for the CISOs. We are the folks that need your help, your creativity, your ingenuity. You know, I have to say, I just love that thing. I don't know if One Dark One is out there, um, but I love the design. One Dark it. One is the designer, Melanie. She's been doing the design Fantastic. for B Sides Las Vegas and many other security and hacker events for more than a decade. So we're going to give her, uh, let's give her a round of applause. Huge. For, you know, yes. Making sure, she's been making sure that. Hacker events and our community events get the color, the passion, the recognition oh, okay. that we want. So it really helps. I, 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 I don't know, know if she wrote this, but it's but the themes are the solar punk themes. Solar of punk. Demand utopia, fight dystopia. Like that. Could you be, resonate that, with that, that message? I do resonate with that. Fight dystopia in particular, uh, but it represents the hacker mindset, self-taught curiosity, do-it-yourself resourcefulness right to repair autonomy and moral conscientiousness. Amen. Yeah, is that so? I, I agree with those values and I think uh, it's fantastic it. that, you That's know. That's why I'm here. I, I believe you're uh, quite definitely one of the first uh, CISA Direct, one, one of the first government officials to come out to embrace the hacker community in such a way. I remember vividly about a decade ago when General Keith Alexander was the head of the NSA and the Cyber Command, and he came out to engage uh, with the community, and he said, in this room right here is the talent our nation needs, and people responded, then stop arresting us, please. <laughs> so a lot has changed in the past decade, and I think that the role of friendly hackers, of of security researchers, of community initiatives has been 
it's never been as important as it is right now. So Jen, would you like to share with the, with the room some of your thoughts about what CISA is doing to help prepare the nation and corporates from the ever evolving threat landscape. Hold on, it's a drinking game. Every time I say ever evolving threat landscape, I must drink. It's just water, don't worry. It's just water? Mostly water. Okay. Um, but then again, a lot of beverages are mostly, right. in, in fact, all it's beverages five are mostly. somewhere. Yeah. Um, so CISA, does everybody know what CISA is? Pretty much, yeah, okay, so we're the newest agency in the federal government, but uh, we're coming up on our fifth birthday. Uh, as Karen said, I've been in the job for a little over two years, but you know, we were created to be America's civilian cyber defense agency, and the mission is to understand and manage and reduce risk to the cyber and physical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. And, you know, when you say critical infrastructure, people think it's kind of a technical term, but at the end of the day, it's the water we drink, it's our health care, it's our education, our transportation, our communication, how we get money from the bank and, and gas from the, uh, the uh, uh, gas station. And so this really is about protecting the networks and the systems and the businesses that we rely on every day. And, you know, frankly, the vast majority of it is owned and operated by the private sector. And CISA is not a regulator, we're not an intel collector, we're not a law enforcement agency, we're not military, we are a voluntary partnership agency. And we know that the currency of partnership is trust. And so every day it's about creating trusted partnerships across the federal government, but more importantly, with all of the owners and operators, critical infrastructure, the research community, the hacker community, the threat, uh, the threat intel community, state and local, and so that's what we do every single day to help uh, protect the nation. And, you know, frankly, one of the things that we are very focused on during our time at Black Hat and uh, DEF CON is resilience. Mm. So when you think about the evolving threat landscape... Oh, you want some of my drink? Maybe I'll drink. <laughs> You're better off with that, trust me. Think about the evol <laughs> when you think about the evolving yeah. threat landscape, um, it is my belief, given the interdependence, given the vulnerability, given the connectedness, everything is digitized now. Frankly, it becomes more and more difficult to prevent bad things from happening, mm. to prevent disruption from happening. And so we're doing a couple things on this. First, we are really trying to catalyze a revolution to go upstream so we're not bolting on security solutions, but actually creating technology that is secure, by design. So that is the only way I think we can get ahead of threats that are becoming more and more sophisticated, well-resourced, and criminals where the bar to entry is getting lowered and lowered. But I also think we need to recognize, even as we catalyze the secure by design revolution, bad things are gonna happen, disruption is gonna happen. So the most important thing we can do is to be resilient to it. What does that mean? It means that we expect and anticipate that bad things are gonna happen. We build our plans to expect and anticipate bad things are gonna happen so that we can respond effectively and recover to mitigate risk to our businesses, to our networks, and frankly, to our country, just knowing some of the threats that are out there. And I'm very excited in a couple hours, I'm gonna be doing a keynote at Black Hat with my Ukraine counterpart, Viktor Zora. And I hope he talks a lot more than me because he has so many fantastic things to say about what the Ukrainians have been doing to build their resilience and not just cyber resilience, but their operational resilience as they're dealing with an onslaught of cyber attacks, but frankly, barbaric kinetic attacks mm -hmm. from the Russians and they're able to continue to keep going and frankly, societal resilience, right? I mean, this is a people that have stayed unified, incredible courage, incredible focus on beating the adversary. Absolutely, and uh, I do hope you have a chance to catch this keynote later this afternoon. Speaking about Ukraine, we can learn so much from what's happening. So of course we should help or do what we can to help, but some of the phenomena that I've been tracking is, uh, or are things like the Ukrainian cyber army, 
which is basically a partisan group of hackers and volunteers helping defend Ukraine from Russian attacks, helping spread the, in, in, helping fight disinformation and spread accurate information online, and through a variety of other ways supporting what's happening there. So this is very important. Now, Jen, I'd like to come back uh, to the conversation here. Can you tell us a little bit more about Secure by Design? Because I think this is, it's not just a slogan, this is a very important initiative that you're driving, and I believe security professionals need to be aware of that. Yeah, Th thanks for asking. Let me just set this up a little bit because I think everybody in this audience, and can people hear me? I don't know if this thing's working. Can you yeah. hear me in the back? All the way in the cheap seats in All the back. Right. I'm thanks. kidding, there are no cheap seats. It's a thanks. sold out event. So, I mean, it's a very sophisticated audience. So, look, we know, go back 40 years, sort of the short history of the internet, and let's pick 1983 when TCP IP was implemented so computers could talk to each other, right? Since that time, security was never, ever, ever thought about for the internet, right? It wasn't created, it wasn't designed to be secure. As Dan Kaminsky said, the, the internet was designed to move pictures of cats, and it's very good at moving pictures of cats. So from the early days, security was not thought of. And then you had the explosion of software. And that was all about speed to market and driving down cost and cool features. It wasn't about security, right? So you now have an internet full of malware, you have software full of vulnerabilities, and we had the age of social media where everybody thought it was cool to move fast and break things. I'm okay with breaking things, but frankly, we also have to fix things, we have to build things, right? And that's what I love about hackers is they're not just about breaking, they wanna break into things so that we can also fix things, right? It's where you talked about in your TED talk about the internet's immune system, Absolutely. right? You break things with that mindset to get things better and better. But we had social media, which was never supposed to be secure, right? And so now we have a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and quite frankly, and I say this as a mom, we have a lot of mental health issues for our kids from some of the issues around social media. And here we are going into the world of artificial intelligence, and there's a lot being talked about this week on artificial intelligence, but it's the same thing. You know, everyone's rushing now that we've got this incredible capabilities coming the explosion of large language models, three times the speed of Moore's law, so moving incredibly quickly, but how can frankly, we inject yeah, security exactly. into that you very, have very to fast think process? About building security in on the front end. This is about innovation, but it's about responsible innovation. So mm -hmm. to sort of set that up, we were talking at the end of last year with some of my teammates, Jack Cable, well-known security researcher, some of you might know him, Bob Lord on my team was the CISO for Twitter and the DNC, Grant Dasher, who joined us from Google, Lauren Zabirik joined us from Harvard. So basically you're building the Justice League. Yes, security. we are the Justice League. You're missing Wonder Woman. Oh, maybe and you, you are Wonder Woman. By the way, I think you're Wonder Woman. Okay. By the way, I am also here to do some recruiting, so oh. definitely come see us at our booth. Is that what's I on your hand? The, the, the so QR there's a QR code is my a recruiting like, QR code Barbie tattoo. Orchid Sis. I have even tattooed myself because I Love systems. So look, look at this commitment to recruiting hackers. Exactly. To exactly. Hey, you are tattoo. That's never been. I don't think that's ever been done exactly. on this stage. Exactly. So. It's fantastic. So, so you have these amazing, so talented individuals. They came. They really catalyzed this. So they came up with this um, principles and approaches to secure by design, secure by default. We rolled it out in April. I gave a big speech just before we rolled it out at Carnegie Mellon, which was fantastic. And I have to tell you, the response that we've gotten from the community, to include industry, has been incredible. And so we've done a lot of listening sessions. For all you out there, we're doing a red pen session at DEF CON. So please, please, please stop by. We really want feedback. Hold on, Jen. What is a red pen session? It's not a red team session. It's not a pen testing session. Okay, so those are the terms our hackers and security researchers are familiar with. What is a red pen session? Are you red teaming and pen testing a document? Red lines. It's red actually, lines? you take a red An pen. An actual red pen, okay. <laughs> and you like cross out what you don't like and maybe check mark what you do like. All right, so this sounds like a very interactive opportunity it's to like, actually the influence red what, team and pen, and pen test. Right? You, you lit, you're testing a pen, you're testing the pen. So that's a literal <laughs> joke. But this is an actual opportunity, an interactive opportunity for you to influence 
exactly. What, what CISA and what Jen and her team are pushing. So what time is this happening again? It's out there. It's I don't there know, the but okay. I will now post it. Somewhere in the galaxy, yeah. there's Somewhere in the galaxy, for us exactly. The so galaxy let's talk about Vegas. more opportunities for hackers. Feedback, right? Like it's security day, researchers. I mean, it goes back to like your whole thing about immunity, right? The more crowdsourcing we can have of smart people who are, you know, intellectually curious, who are resourceful, who want to solve problems we can be better together right, at the end of the day. And so, I mean, one of my operating principles in life is to treat feedback as a gift. Now, like, I don't really, like, if you're going to be an asshole about feedback, I don't love that. But if it's, like, <laughs> legit and constructive, then I'm good with that as well. So we really do continuously want feedback on our advisories, on the products we do. You know, there's some stuff that's been done with our work that I think has made it better and better, and it's been sort of pivoted around in ways that I think can be more useful to the community. So please give us feedback, even if you're not in the red pen session, please take a look at the principles on the website and give us um, your thoughts. You. She has what? She has the time for you. Please. All right, what time is it? Saturday at 11. Saturday at 11, where? And at Black Hat, at DEF CON? At DEF CON. It's a DEF CON. I think you had to, like, truth and lending, I think you had to sign up for it ahead of time. Okay. So yeah, I'll be there. You workshop. can come. We'll, like, get more people in there. All right. Is over. So let's talk about ways that hackers... Thank you very much. So let's talk about ways that hackers can interact, not just with the recommendations and guidelines, but with the actual vulnerabilities that are out there in the world. By finding vulnerabilities, yeah. you know, there's a, um, a law. Is it Linus's law? Uh, given enough eyeballs or bugs are shallow. Have you heard this one before? I hope I got the quote correct. Sounds so, like Linus from Lucy. Yeah, from, and no, it's Linus from uh, Linux. So, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, the originator of the Linux operating system. So, uh, uh, but Linus and Lucy is like a Snoopy thing or a peanuts. Okay, different, different. Okay, Let's different, like different Snoopy American thing. cartoon that I did not grow up on. Uh, but we grew. By the way, we grew up in Israel on American cartoons. But like ten years later, so we we got stuff like in delay, which is why I'm. Do you know, I'm, do you know Schoolhouse Rock? Yes, I have. Do you know Schoolhouse Rock? Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah. Awesome. It's my passion, Cyber Schoolhouse Rock. Cyber Schoolhouse That's Rock. My post sissa job. All right, school is in session, exactly. rockers. So, how can hackers report vulnerabilities, directly interact with what the agency is doing, what vendors and companies are doing, when we still have so many of the Fortune 500 companies that don't have a vulnerability disclosure program or they don't have a security.txt? document somewhere on their website that gives out the details on who to communicate with. I know that as part of Secure by Design, you have some of the language or that originated with my sister's work on legalizing bug research and decriminalizing the work of hackers. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because, yeah. by the way, uh, Jen mentioned earlier Jack Cable. For those of you unfamiliar with Jack Cable, he started his path as a security researcher uh, with the Hack the Pentagon program, where he won all three of their challenge coins before he uh, was a senior at high school. So it literally changed his life, protected his nation, created a trajectory for him to become a security researcher, a fellow with uh, the Defense Security Agency, mm -hmm. a, a team member at CISA, you know. So these types of programs, I believe, these types of interactions, each person here in this room can be that next hero that you need to recruit into the Justice League or yeah. to just use their talent to identify vulnerabilities. So what can you do, what can we do to help them help everybody? Yeah, first of all, is Jack out there? I know he's in Vegas. Well, he might be uh, watching us yeah, from a discreet okay. location. And then, in so on the CVD stuff, Ian Deason is my teammate out there somewhere. So he just yeah, gave, all the way Ian. back. So he just gave, you know, one of the things I love about B-Sides is this proving ground. Um, Thing you can do. A new so stage for new speakers. He just speakers. gave his like first proving ground talk on our coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So we run that for the government, and essentially, we work between researchers and vendors. Certainly, if they can't come together, and that happens a lot, um, to essentially work through that whole process to make sure that the uh, vulnerability is disclosed responsibly, that there's a patch. We look at timing, obviously, because we want to make sure that. There's not excessive uh, exploitation once the vulnerability is disclosed. Uh, one of the other really cool things that we did that I think is one of the most important things that, that the team did 
is what we call Binding Operational Directive 2201, which is oh, that's our, a catchy name. Binding yeah, Operational yeah, Directive right. 2201. This is, the, this is the government. So what we did was instead we called it the KEV. The KEV. The, uh, known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog. Has anyone heard of that? Known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog, the KEV. That sounds like a person I'd like so, to meet, the KEV. Like Kev. The Kev yeah, exactly, yeah. KEV, right? And so the innovation here was we all know that there's a ton of vulnerabilities, and frankly, that's what we're trying to do is secure by design. We should stop accepting that technology products come off the line full of vulnerabilities. Like, we've normalized that in some crazy way, hmm. and it is unacceptable. So we want to make sure that actually we're lessening that. But as we catalyze that revolution, the thing that we're focused on here is ensuring that people uh, know in a prioritized way how they patch the most severe vulnerabilities. So the KEV is essentially vulnerabilities that we know, whether it's through Intel or other sources, that are being exploited in the wild by threat actors. And so it really helps with prioritization. Now, it's only binding on the .gov that we're the operational lead for, but a lot of private sector have taken that and uh, looked at it and used it for prioritization. So I think it's really important. So it's, it's becoming uh, adopted it's becoming by a more thing. I think a lot of people, yeah. I'm, I'm chatting with uh, Patrick Garrity from Nucleus Security, another security researcher who did this cool thing. I posted it on social media. He took the Kev and he did it in terms of like, anyone know Piet Mondrian? He's a Dutch painter. Yeah, I put like a whole like, painter thing and I'm, okay. I'm a frustrated art historian so okay, cool so it's like the art and science so Montreal is, it's got cubes and stuff Old in it cube thing yeah cool. big the biggest ones are did he use any yeah. AI to create that I don't know he might have so that's why uh, I brought up AI because I want to talk about AI. okay yeah <laughs> so, it was a very elegant segue. AI. so uh, it's kind of impossible to not talk about the uh, AI and um, I'm really am keen to hear your perspective and CISA's perspective yeah. Uh, I know you're also tasked with election security, which is an area you have a, a new um, member of your team focused on that with uh, yeah. your senior advisor. Kate Conley. Yes. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about AI and generative AI and how can we trust the information? How can we trust the devices, the technologies that we interact with and what CISA is doing on that front? Yeah. So I don't think we can trust it. And okay. I think that's part of the issue, frankly. This is all happening so fast. These are powerful tools. It's another form of technology, which is why you think about the internet, mm -hmm. software, social media, AI. It's another technology that we need to focus on building in a secure way. So a lot of work going on to try and ensure we can trust it. But frankly, I think this is early days, and that's why so much work is happening both in the US but around the world in terms of getting our arms around trust and safety and security. From a CISA perspective, we're very focused on three things. For, first of all, how do we responsibly use these capabilities for cyber defense? Okay. Uh, how do we assure AI systems? I think that's very important to have uh, an understanding about how to audit, how to test some of these new capabilities wherever they're implemented and instantiated, particularly as people start putting this in everything. And then, you know, finally, we're looking at the full range of threats to critical infrastructure, because that's obviously our focus, but both physical threats and cyber threats. And again, stipulate that these capabilities can do amazing things, but they can also do amazing things for very bad people, mm. who I think will be able to use them for cyber attacks, for chemical attacks, for biological attacks. So we have to cost that into what we're doing. Now, my concern is, incredible capabilities, but they can also be used as incredible weapons. Indeed. And it's not governments that are building these things and securing them, it's private industry who at the end of the day are fiduciarily responsible for making money. Yeah, to their shareholders, to their investors. And so this is why the White House is looking to bring together the big companies and they've made voluntary commitments, but voluntary will only take us so far. And mm. frankly, even if the big seven companies are responsibly innovating, a lot of this is already out there in open source. So I think we have to assume that there are going to be risks that end up happening, which goes back to my earlier point. resilience point. <clears throat> resilience, exactly right. So what I want to uh, go to now is we are almost at the end of our session. And I regret that we may not have time to take everybody's questions. But I do want to tell you that Jen and her team uh, 
they're going to answer your questions online. Or at least I'm not, I'm not promising for Jen, but <laughs> you can certainly reach out and interact with CISA in more than just in person right here. But what I wanted to talk about is with regards to AI and trust, one of the mechanisms to establish trust is to demand accountability and transparency, yeah. right? So we can trust what we can see, what we can look at, we can trust. And one of the problems with the untrustworthiness, if that's a word, untrustworthiness of existing AI is that a lot of it is opaque. You, it's a black box. You don't know how it works. You don't know how it reaches the conclusions. Yeah. So transparency can be a tool. And I know that one of the things you've been working on <coughs> is uh, radical transparency yep. in technology. Do you want to say a few words on that? And then we'll yeah, go to the closing question. Yeah, just go principles. So there's three principles if you look at the document. And we, we didn't What do you them, mean the document? The document that is principles and approaches for secure by design. It's on our website, cisa.gov forward slash secure by design. So the principles <clears throat> that Jack and others created, they're not technical principles, right? What we wanted to do was put this in the language of business. Because at the end of the day, that, the, the imperative has to come from the senior level to resource the engineers and the technical people to ensure that they're creating safe tech. So it's all about business owners owning the outcomes for security. So not placing the burden of security on small businesses, on individuals, on app developers. Really, at the end of the day, you have to think about the frameworks that are being put in place so that the big technology manufacturers who are creating these frameworks in the big tech, that they understand that they own that responsibility for security outcomes. Two, to your point, Karen, radical transparency. You know, as my great friend Jeff Moss always says, transparency creates trust. Mm. And I'm a huge believer in that, right? Always shining a light on what you're doing ensuring that people understand and that's part of the problem with some of these AI models is they're not transparent, mm -hmm. they are a black box. And that's why it's incredibly important that we as a community very loudly call for that radical transparency. And we're starting to see that from some of the big companies who are saying, this is where we're at in terms of implementing enterprise uh, MFA. This is where we're at in terms of a roadmap for memory safety. Mm -hmm. So we are calling for specific things. Please do look at that document because I would love, love, love your feedback. Um, and so all, all, all of these business outcomes, the last one is that these outcomes need to be owned by senior business leaders. Again, that is where the decisions get made and the resource decisions uh, get done. So we really need this to be taken on by the business community so they can support the tech community to ensure that we're building security in from the beginning. Absolutely. So uh, just about this AI topic, there is going to be at DEF CON a generative AI versus hackers hacking event or challenge. Uh, I believe that's happening on Friday or Saturday. Amit uh, knows the details, but check out the AI Village at DEF CON. If you are interested to become an AI security researcher and you don't know where to start, I think that's a good place to start because that's not a job that's going to go away. Uh, unless AI uh, makes all of us redundant, in which case we have other problems to, uh, to contend with. So uh, just to close this off before they throw us off the stage, uh, and thank you Spam and thank you DT for hosting us kindly. Last, you know, last two minutes, I want to talk about workforce and I want to talk about how we can multiply. Uh, we're definitely going to need all the humans that we can get, whether it's to work alongside the AI systems or help defend the humanity that's left in us. Uh, so yeah. B-Sides, I think, is a big community for bringing new people in. There's the hiring ground, there's the proving ground. In Israel, in B-Sides, we do a lot of recruitment efforts. We recently did the Hacker Riot event to bring 300 women into cybersecurity roles, into their first cybersecurity job. Can you tell us a little bit about how you and the agency are looking at the workforce issue, if there's anything that you want people to know, yeah. and maybe you want to remind them about your tattoo again? Yeah. So look, we hired 1,330 people, I think, over the last what, two years. What, not 1,337? Oh, you already had oh, some. Maybe people. it was 1,337. Yeah, that would be a good, that. yeah, yeah. that's going to be a good number. So how did we do it? Because it's hard to hire technical talent in the government. We don't want to be like the government. Right? At the end of the day, we want to have the kind of culture that attracts people who are intellectually curious, who are problem solvers, the hackers, right? And we do that. Go to our website and look at our culture. It's all about flexibility. It's about 
creativity. It's about inclusiveness because we believe everybody can contribute to solving the hardest problems for our nation. So we've got multiple ways to join CISA. Uh, you can join through our Cyber Innovation Fellow Program. You can live anywhere in the country and join us. You can work on really hard problems. So please come to our recruiting booths. Yes, you can check out our QR code and takes you to very specific uh, jobs that we've got open this week. We're hiring, I think, 200 more and we'll be almost more. We'll be closing out our hiring. So please do join us. Um, and if you have any questions at all, in all seriousness, I'm happy to stay after and, and answer. I them. have one final question for you, Jen. Yeah. Do the people who work for you get to wear cat ears and have like fun colors in their like, hair and their nails? Like, like props, she looks like props fun. to DT because I saw somebody walking around with cat ears and I almost stole them from him and he like found me some. Thank so. you for preventing federal crime by Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. So, thank Thanks. you, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much.